first we're going to begin with a pre-flight in anticipation of a flight today. And when I walk up to the airplane, as I kind of eyeball it in the hangar, I kind of look at the way it's sitting to see if I've got a flat oleo. Uh, just kind of look it all over, uh, general appearance of the airplane. Once I determine things look somewhat promising, I then uh, go to the back of the seat and I pull out uh, the hull plugs. And you'll notice at the top of the door it says check hull plugs. Leaving plugs out of a flying boat is uh, pretty serious. You end up uh, getting all excited. There are 11 quarter inch pipe hull plugs that are in the hull and an additional three in each wingtip float for a total of 17. So we've got a pretty detailed pre-flight inspection procedure we go through and we're pretty religious about this. It's a pretty complicated airplane and a lot of these things need to be looked at pretty religiously. So the first thing we need to do, it says number one, uh, we're going to check all the hull, hull plugs. So let's walk around slowly to the front of the airplane. And most of the hull plugs you'll find along the keel strip. The first of which is clear up here in the nose. So if I take this, uh, we always install the plugs with the Allen wrench on its long axis. So this goes in here. So this way you don't over tighten. And about every five hours we tend to uh, lightly grease those plugs so they don't gall. It's also noteworthy that these plugs are brass because you're threading this into an aluminum boss. If you use an aluminum plug on aluminum, they're going to gall. Stainless steel will also gall. Brass tends to be very good. If you strip one of these bosses out, you're looking at having to re-rivet, re-PRC, seal, and reinstall. So with that said, pre-flight, I would go along and check all the hull plugs. Again, there's 11 in the hull and three in each float. While I'm down here, I'm also going to look at the planing surface. And I can eyeball all the way down the hull and make sure that we didn't hit something in the last flight. Uh, if you hit something in the water, you can uh, do quite a bit of damage. Uh, we've been fortunate to uh, not have an issue in 300 hours. We kind of pick our water battles pretty carefully. So we're looking at the planing surface. I'm going to take just a minute and walk around the back of the step as well. One of the things that makes the goose so wonderful on the water, the step is ventilated. So once you get on step, you've got a lot of air which is going to ventilate and create a bubble stream down here that really helps the airplane get up on step. Some gooses, depending on the variant, model number, and engine conversion, is actually shorten the step, which tends to make it a bit more pitchy, and I don't really understand the benefit of that. But our airplane does have the stock original vented step. Appreciate as you work your way back further, we've got a second step. And again, we've got a step back here at station 29, followed by a, uh, a curved fuselage section that goes back to the tail. So we've got two secondary steps. The airplane is very, very stable on the water. I think this wonderful hull design is a big part of that success story. Okay, while I'm back here, I'm gonna have to lay down and I'm looking up the tail wheel for three things. I want to make sure that the oleo has at least five fingers, meaning that the oleo has not collapsed and it does not need to be serviced with nitrogen. Secondly, I'm looking for two springs that hold the tail wheel centered. Appreciate this is a full swivel tail wheel that locks in the trailed position. Those centering springs tend to bias the tail wheel into trail. The next thing I look at is a tail wheel lock. There's a pin that drops in and make sure that's not broken and that's clear. And of course, I'm going to look at the tire for inflation. So that kind of completes this section back here. The next item is I'm going to look at the tail surfaces. And when you see some of the flying videos, the tail really gets beat up. On takeoff, this is a whole lot of drama going on back here. There's a lot of water coming back over this tail. 900 horsepower blowing water and waves and turbulence and everything back here. So we really want to inspect this carefully. There is an AD note on these airplanes for the strut. And you'll notice that this lower strut fitting, there's actually a requirement. This is replaced every 1,000 hours. We actually take this off 
and magna flux at every 500 just as a safety issue. And the issue is a crack right here. You'll notice that I've got this CAD plated and baked and clear coated. I don't paint it intentionally so I can look for cracks right here typically between the thread and this fillet transition on that fitting. A very high stressed part that I want to look at. I always take and bang the strut and make sure things are secure. In addition to that, I go to the horizontal stabilizer and I kind of bounce it and make sure things are solid. There's also an AD every 50 hours we have to check the front horizontal attach fitting for cracks. And that's a visual inspection or die pen. That's done at 50 and uh, uh, virtually uh, every 50 flight hours. So that's kind of another critical point. As we work our way around, we've got uh, an aerodynamic counterbalance on the top of the elevator. And I always smack that and make sure it's secure. Obviously, if this came loose and broke off, it could potentially cause an elevator flutter. I'm going to work my way around now to the trim tab, and I'm looking for play in the linkage here. And this needs to be no more than, uh, than 3 sixteenths of an inch. I like to keep this one in a, about a sixteenth. And when you start seeing some play here, you can actually shim the uh, trim regulator with uh, little 30 thou shims and bias that out. So we kind of keep track on that. Consequently, the same is true of the rudder trim, and that's also tight. The opposing elevator trim on this side, these are very tight. I'm also going to move the elevator, make sure things are smooth. I don't hear any scary noises. I can also visually look at each of the hinge points, which are these big castings that go around and uh, connect to the trailing edge spar of the fin and the trailing edge spar of the horizontal. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And I just make sure that none of those bolts fell out and things are breaking. That could be a critical uh, safety issue as well. Right down here, these are the elevator or correction rudder steering cables. They're cotter pinned, and let's make sure they're secure. As these rudder cables come out through the back of the fin, there's actually a seal here that has to be watertight. And that's a leather seal that's packed with grease where that cable goes in and out. We just make sure that's secure as well. This is obviously just a jack point. Okay, next item, we talk about emergency exits. There's five ways out of this airplane. There's the emergency exit on the far side, the main cabin exit on the left side, both the pilot and co-pilot windows. You can pull a pin and slide the windows back and go out the cabin windows. The fifth way out of this airplane is through the nose, open the hatch, and out the nose. So five ways, the nose, the flight deck, and the cabin. Okay, I'm going to check the flap return springs. The flaps on this airplane are activated with vacuum. There's actually a uh, dash six fitting above the throttle body. So when you're at idle and below atmospheric pressure, you're uh, subjecting a big storage tank to sub-atmospheric pressure vacuum. Up in the nose, you'll see in a few minutes, there's a big trash can up there with a check valve. So when you're at idle, you're producing a lot of vacuum, and that vacuum source is used to deploy the flaps. So I'm going to pull the flaps all the way down and I'm making sure that the return spring is not broken. I'm going to survey the hinges here to make sure they're sound. So when I let this go, the spring is going to pull the flap back up. Inside this section of the wing is a big cylinder. It's about 10 inches in diameter with two pistons. So when you select flaps 30, the forward piston sucks all the way forward it gives you flaps 30. When you select flaps 60, the second piston sucks back and fully extends that double acting cylinder, if you will, to give you flaps 60. So you can select 0, 30, and 60. It's all vacuum. The wonderful thing about that system is like your old Ford. When you go up a hill on a rainy day, your windshield wipers slow down with your old Ford vacuum windshield wipers. This airplane on a go-around, when you nail the power, uh, you start to lose some vacuum pressure. Aerodynamically, the flaps will fly up a bit, which really kind of prevents them from being damaged. And at some point, you'll run out of vacuum, they'll fully retract kind of slowly. So uh, the danger of a VFE, or an overflap extension speed, is pretty minimal in this airplane. In fact, in landing, your flaps uh, are selected flaps 30, and then flaps 60. And you don't get that full 60 degrees of flap 
until you're kind of in the flare. We come over the fence at about 90 and roll it on, you know, in the high 70s. And a lot of times you're rounding the airplane out, you'll feel the flaps come down that last little bit as you round the airplane out prior to touchdown. Okay, I'm going to work my way out to uh, each of the pontoons. And I'm going to make sure all these wires are tight. If they're not tight, we would be suspicious that we've bent something. Something in the wing has changed. So this geometry should stay consistent. And the top of the float is a little vent hole. And that has to be clear, or when you climb up, you'll build uh, pressure inside this float and you could damage it. And there's also one, two, three plugs. So this float looks good. I just kind of give it a shake and make sure things are solid. It's pretty dang solid. Uh, I can also look along the leading edge of the wing for dents, inspection panels that are loose, my landing light lens is intact, etc. Prior to this uh, presentation, we bring a, a big table up here and we rotate the propellers, uh, typically nine blades or four and a half revolutions to mechanically clear the engines. If we've flown the airplane within a day or two, typically we'll motor with the starter and uh, rely on the starter clutch to slip in the unlikely event that we get a hydraulic lock. But if it's sat for more than a few days, we go through the effort of manually pulling uh, each engine through. Okay, I'm looking for leaks. Also notice the hardware on either side of the nacelle up here on the front cowling. I just want to make sure they're safety wired and tight. I don't have some big oil leak coming down the front of the engine and all the Zeus's are tight. So that kind of concludes what I can see from here. We work our way back around the nose and repeat the same inspection on the right nacelle. Okay, all the cowl hardware is intact. We don't have a horrible oil leak. Uh, another little side note, if the airplane hasn't been flown in a few days and we do use the platform, we do visually inspect every cylinder between the barrel and the head to make sure we're not getting separation. That's a 100 hour AD as well, a visual inspection to make sure we don't have any oil leakage between the steel barrel and the aluminum head. So we visually kind of look at that at least every other flight to make sure we don't have an issue. With that said, we're going to do the same inspection on this float. So all my wires are tight, my vent is clear, one, two, three plugs. Landing light, leading edge, inspection panels. This of course is the PDOT tube for the airspeed. The static source is also there. Also be aware on the water, in big water you got to kind of be careful on a left hand turn because you get the right wing very low in big water and the float will hang down and you can actually get a big wave right into that PDOT tube and screw your system up. So when we're on big water, we're kind of careful about keeping water out of that PDOT tube. There's a drain inside the cabin that we can open if necessary. We're at the landing gear assembly, which is kind of critical. And the first thing we look at is we want to have uh, six fingers of oleo extending. And this greatly influences the camber of the wheels. So that's kind of important. If one oleo is very low and one's very high, the airplane because of its long wingspan can really sit kind of crooked on the runway. This is the over center spring. As the landing gear extends, this spring pops the gear over center. We want to make sure all this linkage is in good shape. I've got uh, two brake calipers. We're just looking for uh, brake fluid leaks. That looks good. Very important, these are the linkage or the linkage that operates the, uh, the gear door. And I've got a little yellow or correction orange tag here that ensures these clamps don't slip. If they do slip, the landing gear can come up and the little gear door can hang uh, proud, which would be a hydraulic uh, issue on the water, could do some damage. We actually had that happen one time, it actually bent the door. Uh, looking at the wheel itself, at the conclusion of our water work, even daily, uh, we remove the hubcap and we got a zerk fitting and we pump waterproof grease into the wheel uh, to get the uh, water out of the assembly. We also grease the tail wheel. We do that pretty much about every second or third flight if we're flying the airplane daily. And then about every 10 hours we go through and grease all of the landing gear actuation linkage, which is kind of critical. I've got a port and we take a quart jar. I typically have someone inside the airplane that opens the valve and that's how we sump the tanks. This system is very simplistic. The center section is comprised of two outboard 
110 gallon tanks. They feed to a common fuel selector which is left, right or both and both engines run off that same tank selection status. So if you're on both, both engines are being fed from both tanks. So both tanks feed the fuel selector, they typically to a gas collator, to a wobble pump for manual fuel pressure and out to the engines. If you're on the right tank, both engines are running off the right tank. If you're on the left tank, both engines are running off the left tank. So it's kind of cool. There's a mechanical fuel pump on both engines and there's a crossfeed feature. In the unlikely event that you have a mechanical fuel pump failure, you can open a crossfeed valve which lets the good remaining mechanical driven fuel pump run both engines. So crossfeed is typically tested during the startup which we'll demonstrate to you and then that's not used again unless it's an emergency. There's actually an AD note in the original JRF Navy flight manual they did all their takeoffs with crossfeed on and shut it off at altitude. Well they found they could get a, a fuel starving issue with crossfeed issues. So that's only turned on in an emergency. So with that said, we're going to go up on top and finish the last of the pre-flight, which is typically done above uh, the cabin. We're up here checking a few things. Uh, the first of what we do is check the fuel status. And again, this airplane holds 110 aside, which is 220 gallons, which is a lot of weight. For local flights, we usually fly this at 75 aside or 150 gallons, and we budget to be very safe, 50 gallons an hour. So that gives us three hours, two hours of flying with one hour reserve. Uh, in cruise, we can actually bring this thing back to about 42 an hour. But when we're doing water work and a lot of takeoff and landings, we're burning gas like a drunken sailor. So if we kind of factor 50 an hour, we're pretty safe. So with that said, uh, to check the fuel, I'm gonna open the fuel door. I'm gonna pull the cap off and I've got a stick here. And this is calibrated for the right tank. I'll stick this in here and you can see we've got 70 gallons, kind of right where we want to be. So that works. I'm going to close that up. I'm going to open this next door and right here I've got an APU plug if we got a low battery. I've got my battery located, all my solenoids. I just like to look around here and make sure nothing's falling off. I've also got a port I can put a battery maintainer on here in the wintertime. This airplane has two 12 volt batteries that run in series, so I get 24 volts. So I've actually got a 12 volt solenoid in the left nacelle that completes a connection between the two 12s to give me 24. So a 12 volt solenoid in the left nacelle and a 24 volt solenoid in the right nacelle. So I've got a manual switch, I can actually manually bypass that 12 volt solenoid if I've got a dead battery and actually jump everything with 24 and tie the two batteries together mechanically with this big switch. So that looks good to me, I'm happy there. Next thing I'm going to do is check the oil. So I open this far door and I unscrew a sounding rod. And I pull the sounding rod out and I look at the dipstick here and uh, we're at seven gallons and the airplane uh, holds seven and a half we'd like to run it between six and seven per side and we do our oil changes every 50 hours oil uh, is about a hundred and eighty dollars for each oil change close to 200 bucks every time we do an oil change next thing i do is uh, the exhaust system on gooses is a little bit complicated We've got an input tube here, which is an Inconel tube that goes all the way through and down. And this is just the cabin heat. So ambient air comes in the front. It's heated around the muff and we can direct that warm air into the cabin. The engine exhaust comes out this antler or collector, if you will, and comes out this slit in the top. Because the exhaust is over the top, it's really quiet in the cabin. This is quieter than a twin beach, even in flight take off and cruise. I do take my little stick and I hit and I'm listening for cracks. And in 300 hours we've been through this exhaust system now twice. Uh, fortunately last year I was able to find almost all NOS new parts and things seem to work fairly well. As a side note, 
When you replace an exhaust element, especially at the cylinder, there's three nuts. You need to fly the airplane about two or three hours to go back and retorque everything or it'll get loose. Once the engine gets hot and warm, you got to go back and retorque those uh, nuts and it works great. We've got some access doors here. I can look in and do things like, uh, you know, just check for oil leaks and adjust the carburetor, idles, things like that. Uh, we can see the propellers from here. I could look out at the wing and just look for wrinkles and loose rivets and inspection panels. So that's pretty much everything we do on top. Everything I've done for the right engine, I would then repeat again for the left engine.